My name is Charles Ignacio. Um, I was the producer, then the executive producer at In the Life. I was um, on staff from 1992 to 2002. I came to In the Life through an interesting roundabout way. I read about John Scagliotti's effort to create uh, the first gay series on public television in a magazine that doesn't exist now in New York called Q Magazine. So I um, read about him. I saw that he was going to give a talk at the New York Community Center. And uh, I went there and um, I offered my services as a volunteer. At the time I was working at HBO, I believe. Um, and then after that I worked at Channel 13. So, but during those that time I helped him stuff envelopes, try to do fundraising to raise money for the first episode for the pilot. And um, over that first year, I left Channel 13 and I had coffee with John and I said, John, I'm leaving my job, um, so I'm even more available to you. And he said, how would you like to co-produce the pilot? And so I had never done anything like that before. I was out of, I went to film school at Columbia, but I'd never produced a television show. But I thought for a second, I said, sure. So that was the beginning of my, um, my time at In the Life. I helped produce the pilot with him, um, which was quite a ride, and um, eventually became his successor and stayed on staff for 10 years. When In the Life first started, um, there was no visibility really to speak of for gay and lesbian people on television. Um, this was way before Ellen had her own talk show or even had her own TV series way before Will and Grace. Um, uh, Clinton had just been uh, voted as president, so there was a sense of um, possibility and um, change in the air, but it was still very early. And so it was really exciting to be part of an effort that was going to try to change that. Um, we really, there wasn't a whole lot of out gay um, icons or out gay heroes yet. Not, uh, and now looking back, it's hard to, to think about what that would be like, but really there wasn't anybody that I could remember that was on television at least on a regular basis. We were trying to counteract that by really getting people to uh, say that they were out, that they were um, proud to be gay and lesbian. And uh, I think that was something that, that we did that was different. I know it was really important for us on the production staff to really show the, the diversity of the LGBT community. So we really uh, made an effort to get different representations, make sure that we had, like on the pilot, the uh, lesbian and gay Lavender Light Gospel Chorus, for example, that we had um, a lesbian dancer on that show that we even had a panel of filmmakers. Back then it was, gosh, it was Todd Haynes and B. Ruby Rich on the pilot. Um, Marlon Riggs, even we were able, I, I remember now that I, I shot an interview with Marlon Riggs, probably one of his last interviews before he passed away to be part of our segment on LGBT filmmakers. So that was really important uh, to get that diversity across and I think that really shows throughout the 20 years of In the Life that really from the get-go it was a big, um, it was part of the effort to really show the breadth of the LGBT community and to do service to that. It was important to me that anybody that we had on the program we attributed their name on the show. So we told them, we said, if you want to be interviewed on In the Life we're going to put your name on um, we'll lower, we call it lower thirding or putting their name on the screen. And so some, of the, some people that we approach didn't want to be on the show because of that. But I'm very proud that um, all those early episodes, the people that we got on, they really wanted to take a stand and say, I'm going to be on this LGBT program. I'm gay. I'm lesbian. I'm proud of that. That was new. Nobody, I don't think there was any TV show that... Um, allowed that kind of um, ex display of being out. When In the Life started in 92, uh, we'd just come out of a very conservative period in American history uh, when Ra Reagan was president and 
Um, there's a lot of anti-gay sentiment. Um, we were dealing with the AIDS crisis already. It had been around for several years. So it was very oppressive for being an LGBT person at that time. Um, I think that being part of a, a show that was trying to celebrate being gay and lesbian, that was something new. And to have it on public television, that was almost kind of subversive <laughs> because public TV is an American institution. So right away you're dealing with a segment of the population who at the time was thought to be really fringe or you know, out there or not worthy of serious discussion or contemplation. And all of a sudden we're going to be on public television. You know, wow, that's, that's something different. One of the things that made uh, In the Life unique amongst shows that were broadcast on television, any kind of television really, is that its funding came from, really came from the viewers. I mean, John Scagliotti, who created In the Life, before we even shot the pilot, he would meet people and say, we're doing this gay TV show. Um, make sure you can, you can be a part of it by making a donation. Give us $10, $20, $50, whatever. Be a member of In the Life. And I think John got that model from PBS. Because on PBS, as you see a lot of these shows, they say uh, supported by members of PBS. John did the same thing with the show In the Life, but made it very personal, made it about the show. So really, In the Life, as when it started, was dependent on individual donors, really, just $10, $50, $200 there. Very few major donors came on board the first year of In the Life. So we really. <laughs> put together the pilot on such a shoestring budget that the, the majority of everything that was done was through favors that were called in, through an army of volunteers to wrangle the studio audience. We even had a, uh, a volunteer audience coordinator to try to even get a studio audience. I remember uh, <laughs> we, we unfortunately kept our studio audience for like three hours to tape two back-to-back -back episodes and they were like looking at their watches and really wanting to leave. But, it was, um, it was kind of like a circus backstage. The transition to the different stages of In the Life, now that I think about it, um, did not go smoothly, I would say. Uh, although it, we did discover our eventual host in Catherine Linton through that first series of news magazine programs, we actually had a core of six correspondents and two co-hosts. One of the two co-hosts was Catherine Linton, who eventually became our host, but because we had such a shoestring budget, we were shooting in our volunteer director's studio um, lofts in Chelsea, which was this ratty space on like the upper floors of this old building. And we didn't have much of a set to, to um, shoot on, so what he did was he chroma keyed or used a green screen to create this backdrop behind our co-hosts. Uh, that he created on his computer, which, you know, was not the most ideal situation. And frankly, it's kind of a little embarrassing when you look at it now. Um, but that did lead us to wanting to get out of that studio situation. And that led us to sh bringing our host. We finally went down from two, two co-hosts to a single host. We decided to shoot her on location in various places around the city and sometimes around the country. So that was sort of the transition from the variety show format. Actually, the biggest transition from the variety show format is when we ran out of money. I think it was the sixth episode of In the Life when John Skagley said, I'm sorry, Charles, we really don't have a budget. I'm going to have to let all of you go. I said, no, John, there's, an, there's a way we can do another episode. Let's do a best of episode of In the Life. <laughs> all we need to do is to shoot the wraparound hosts. So <laughs> we actually shot John Skagliotti as the kind of co-host of the show, having a dream that he was going to create a TV show. And, <laughs> uh, and in the dream, he was visited by this fairy that was played by another stand-up lesbian comic named Sarah Citron. I don't know how, who came up with these ideas, but we shot them and it was really very funny. So he, in this conceit, he is dreaming that he's going to create a show this fairy is going to show him what he, he could come up with, and we intercut it with some of the best of stuff that we had done in the previous five episodes. But we were able to deliver a, a new episode to our public TV stations, and that's how 
we kind of got through that season and it gave us the summer then to do some more fundraising to then do the the fall premiere episode which was our last I think that was becoming more like a, a news magazine at that point getting us out of the studio getting us on location we shot at the New York City um, Pride Rally of 93 we got um, Leah Delaria to host that episode and um, I guess the rest is history in terms of becoming a news magazine. One of the things that surprised me as a, a young producer of a TV show is that especially one whose audience is primarily uh, a gay and lesbian audience is that you really can't please your whole audience and as we tried to make the show something that appealed to all aspects of the gay and lesbian community we often would alienate another part of our community. I know that we would get um, criticisms from people saying we don't have enough women on the show and we really worked hard to try to make sure that that was the case or we didn't have enough people of color then we'd have people of color on the show and then we get criticism from gay white men that it's too lesbian when we had Leah Delary on as the, the host she that they said she's too in your face and she's too you know let too dykish you know it was, it was hard to hear the prejudices even within the LGBT community about the way the show was being done but it was easy for me in other ways because because we had such a, a limited budget and we were always scrambling I didn't really take any of that personally I was too focused as the producer to just get the show in the can we were just so busy running around shooting things and in the edit room I knew I, I can tell when something um, was off the mark but I can pretty much say that every episode that I oversaw as a producer and then the executive producer I'm very very proud of I can't say that I feel um, that we missed the mark or anything it always seemed to be that they coalesced somehow and if we weren't able to cover the trans community so much in this episode I knew we were going to get to it in the next episode or two episodes down the line because I came from small town life in Indiana, I went to high school there and also went to college there. That was always in the back of my mind in putting the show together. I wanted to make it accessible to as a, much of a mainstream audience as possible. And especially, I would think about uh, maybe the gay teen that I was, um, that wouldn't it be great to have this kind of a, a TV show or a source of information that I didn't have when I was growing up. I also thought too of my own parents, especially my mom. You know, my mom is an immigrant to this country She's from the Philippines, so English is not her first language. And I had already had come out, out to her before I started working on In the Life, but I was always thinking, you know, this can't just reach gay teens. Public television is on for all people in this country, so we also have to reach non-gay people and they are part of our audience too and when we started getting comments from non-gay people or parents of gay people I knew we were doing our job so it was always important for me in producing the series for a, a TV audience that I'd always be reaching I was always thinking of my classmates or friends or even my parents back in the Midwest is this going to reach them is this going to speak to them and one of the my favorite moments was when I had a chance to go back to my alma mater and I, I um, assigned this story to our host Catherine Linton to produce a story on what it was like to be a gay and lesbian student at the University of Notre Dame that would not allow gay students to organize and form a club. This was back in 95. They've since changed that policy but back then that was really really gratifying to me that I was able to do that. One of the great things about what In the Life was trying to do which was to present uh, gay and lesbian lives to a mainstream audience was showing that we really exist in all aspects of American life and in all institutions and I took great pleasure in assigning stories and producing stories that would take something that most Americans think of our bastion of traditionalism and showing well, there's gay people there too so we would do stories about um, the church for example or different religions and we'd find people who were affirming of gay relationships in those faiths. We did a story because um, our host Catherine Linton came out of Clown College. She was a, a, um, a, 
a graduate of Clown College, we did a story of gays and lesbians at the circus. Um, we did stories in the heartland about gay farmers. And one of my favorite stories was I got a chance to come to Los Angeles and visit the Walt Disney Studios and talk to out lesbian gay people, animators, um, producers at the Disney Studios. So it was kind of, I really took pleasure in that. I thought it was great and I thought it was important. Not only was it fun to show, look, gay people are at Disney, they're, at your, they're your doctors and lawyers. We did a great story on a lesbian doctor um, in Seattle, um, Judge Debbie Batts, a federal New York Circuit judge and out lesbian. This is in the late 90s. These kinds of institutions that you don't think there are going to be gay people in, we, we lifted the curtain and pulled it back and said, look, we're everywhere. And so those are some of my favorite stories that I got to either produce or to assign. The thing that made me feel good about in the life and, I, and made me know that we were not only documenting, we were not only documenting the LGBT history at the time, but we were also kind of making history, is the fact that we had a chance to put on camera some of the last interviews or last performances of some people in our community who we've lost. And so that was really important to me that, for example, we had a performance of Michael Callan, a great AIDS activist who was a member of the singing group, the Flirtations, an a cappella group that was, they performed on our second episode. Um, Tom Stoddard, who was one of the early people at Lambda Legal, we interviewed him. Um, Marlon Riggs, the African-American filmmaker who directed Tongues Untied, to talk about what it's like to be a, a black filmmaker working with gay issues. I knew that those interviews were going to be really important for saving for posterity and for the fact, the fact that those are now available here at the UCLA Film and Television Archives is really gratifying and knowing that people can now access them for people who are, are gone. I have always been a pack rat and so it was great to be able to be in a situation an organization where I could use that part of me that likes to save things, um, as well as knowing that what we were shooting was going to be valuable for history. So I was really, really um, adamant that we not throw anything out. And we really kept, we kept all of the source tapes for everything that we shot in the life. People who have an interest in gay rights or the gay community, or are just trying to um, fight for their rights around the world in different countries can now have access to that. So I think it's extremely important that it be made available. Also, um, documentarians or filmmakers who want to know what it was like for gay people in those 20 years that In the Life was on the air, they now have a resource to take a look at, see what were some of the things that were important to the gay community, you know, workplace issues, um, getting your relationship recognized by your community or your um, religion or the government with marriage equality, um, what it was like to come, to come out to your family. Uh, those early years of In the Life, we had a lot of stories on coming out. Since that what seemed to be the main thing that was hindering the um, getting rights for LGBT people was just to come out. So it was important that we did stories of kids coming out to their families, um, organizations like Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, PFLAG, to highlight the work that they were doing, highlighting all the work of all the LGBT organizations. We're also a great record of that. So when some of these organizations, maybe down the line, won't exist anymore, there's a record of all the LGBT organizations on the In the Life program. So I think it's really important that there's this record that's accessible.